Remember, Mozart and Beethoven, they didn't go to a college or a university and get a DMA in musical composition. But he says, when you're talking about melody, that's from God. Join us for Straight Ahead, the Omni American Podcast. Welcome to Straight Ahead, the Omni American Podcast. I'm joined today by my co director of the Omni American Project uh, and co host of Straight Ahead, the Omni American Podcast, the legendary uh, GT, Greg Thomas. Greg, how are you doing today? Doing well, doing well. And we are joined uh, today with, uh, by a very special guest. Um, I simply call him Maestro, uh, my friend and teacher, uh, Dan Asia. Dan, let me give a, for an audience who might not be familiar with you, let me give a, a brief introduction. And Dan Asia is a, an award-winning, eclectic, and unique composer, uh, the recipient of many grants uh, and prizes. Uh, professor of composition at the University of Arizona. But he is also a thinker and a writer. He's the president of the Center for American Culture and Ideas and the author of the 2021 publication, Observations on Music, Culture, and Politics. Uh, I should also add that Dan is a very proud and warm Jew. Um, a strong, he's the president of his, or was president of his local synagogue, a very proud, uh, where's the term with pride Zionist, uh, Dan Asia, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, uh, so let's begin, Dan, by beginning with Albert Murray, uh, Greg Thomas's, uh, teacher and mentor. Um, and I'm a student, I met, I had the fortune of meeting Murray once. Uh, and uh, a student of his writings, and you participated in our 2021 digital event. You read Stomping the Blues and offered a very thoughtful, you know, extensions and elaborations and thoughts after having read Stomping the Blues. I know that you've also read The Omni-Americans. So, Dan, if I were to ask you, why should Americans in general, and Jewish Americans in particular, read Albert Murray, how would you respond? Uh, first of all, Mary, uh, Murray is a deep thinker about American culture and about how American society is built and how its culture functions. And he has a unique perspective that he brings to that. So I think that's the primary reason to read Murray. Um, being a black American, he brings, brings, I think, a different perspective uh, than others can bring to bear light on the situation. Uh, that's, I think, first, first and foremost. But he does it as a cultural observer with a very deep understanding of not only America's past, but its relationship to the West generally. Um, that's what I think is so extraordinary about him. In other words, he's not shrill. Um, he's simply a smart, deep thinker about the situation. Um, in, in both of those books, he, well, he t talks ab about black culture and its development over the hundreds of years. He talks about the importance of the blues and jazz in black culture. But then he says, but folks, this is not just about black culture. That's what's so crucial and so important. Uh, the, the idea of the Omni-American is that we are not white and black. We are Americans. And that you cannot be a white American, quote unquote, whatever that means, and not understand and have partaken of black culture because it's all gemished. It's all together. It's all, it's all one personality. It is all one 
um, expression of being an American. So that's what I find so, yeah, I'll, I'll use the word revolutionary about his ideas. Yeah, I, I think he still speaks uh, as an avant-garde intellectual at the frontier of thinking about American identity, like someone showing up on the frontier, taking aim at the racial essentialists on the left and the right. And it's still a, 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 a revolutionary idea. Greg, did you have anything you wanted to add in response? Uh, I definitely do. I, I would just say that I agree wholeheartedly um, with what you said and how you described both Murray and the Omni American idea. I would just make uh, a little distinction that the term black culture is short in the way you used it for what you said at the very beginning, black American culture. Uh, I think it's important to make a distinction as we do in the Omni American Future Project and as we do on, on this show between race and culture. So people, when you hear black culture, they may think race. I always like to put the American in there. So it's a nationality and the black part is an ethnocultural identity. That's the only little adjustment that I would make. And I like to have a, a conversation about a question that I have for you. So you gave, as, as Arya said, a very um, intriguing presentation uh, for our first annual Omni American Future event. And in it, after reading uh, Murray Stomping the Blues, he made a comparison between jazz and, and classical music. And you stated that classical music is like an image of perfection, whereas jazz is about life itself. Can you expand upon that particular distinction? Yeah, I was, I was thinking about that this morning, as a matter of fact. And I'll, I'll, I'll put another, create another uh, analogous uh, relationship, if you will. So we are all having a conversation right now. We are having it in real time. We are thinking and responding to each other as we go along. It is life lived through time in the, in the very present, as we are right now. As soon as I say something, it is now in the past. I really am not sure what I'm going to say in the future, am I? I'm not, ex I, I'm not I, and I, it's unlikely, as I just did then, I stuttered momentarily because I had to find the word. So there are uh, um, uh, uh, il, uh, um, gaps, there are elisions, there are um, presentations of the process of my thought and your thought as you're listening as we're going along. And we see each other, or we respond not only to our verbal cues, we respond to visual cues as things are, are going along right like this, even, even though we're on a, on a lovely Zoom presentation. That to me is, and, and by the way, some, what happens sometimes as we speak, as I go along, the unconscious does in fact take over, doesn't it? In other words, it has to, because I can't be consciously putting these words together because there are too many words. There are too many things that I'm trying to um, uh, illuminate as we go along. So something is kicking in, something of that spirit in the present as we go along that knows, that tells us we are alive. And that's what I meant by life. I am living life right now as I do this. Now, the composer does this as well, as does the writer. He thinks things on on the fly, and he writes them down. That's the only way that we can describe inspiration at any time in any medium. It happens. It's there. It's present. But the composer looks at it. The writer looks at the sentence and says, hmm, that's not exactly what I was trying to say. It's not exactly what I was trying to get at. What do I really want to say in any form, any art form? And then you go in and you dig in and you figure out, okay, what's the problem here? How do I make it clearer? How do I make it stronger? Oh, what does it also suggest? So what might be the next idea? Or what are various ideas that might be inherent or present in that initial idea? Now, the, the jazz performer is operating in real time. 
the audience hears his mistakes. My jazz teacher, the, the great Jerry Gray, who taught Stu Goldberg and um, Larry Coriel, and to whom great jazz players, when they came up from L.A. to play in Seattle, would surreptitiously take a lesson with Jerry because Jerry would say, you know, that's just junk what you played. Let, let, let's clean this up. <laughs> let's work on this. Come on, come on. And I'm talking about the very best. They'd come up and play right. Jazz Alley in Seattle. So what's the problem? What's the difference? In jazz, you are playing on the fly, right? It's that initial idea. And for me, what I love about the greatest jazz improvisers and performers is they are essentially giving birth to an idea as they go along. And it's not always perfect. It's not always an easy birth. It's I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm getting it closer, I'm getting closer, there it is. I mean, that's why I love Miles, because Miles always played ideas and then stopped and said, hmm, what's the next idea? How do I make that better? Hmm, okay, here you go, guys. The, uh, not quite, not quite. So that's what I meant by the difference, if I may still answer your question because I've forgotten, the difference between real time in life, in the process as it goes through, and the out of time process that the classical composer goes through to perfect every idea along the way. Okay. Now, I forget who the composer was. You'll probably know, Dan. Um, they described composition as frozen improvisation. Mm, mm. It wasn't a composer. I think it was a um, uh, critic, and I think it's a guy named Hanslick. Oh, really? Uh, but I'd have to check. Yeah. Okay. And I think okay. it's the relationship that that's right. That that uh, um, composition is actually frozen architecture. It is living liquid architecture. Okay. I, okay. Something like that. I, I'd have to right. check that. You've you've caught me. You caught okay. me. So some, somebody will check that. So yeah, it's the, and that's another aspect, by the way, of all of this. So thanks for bringing mm -hmm. that up because sure. composers also deal with larger scale architecture, right? And in, in other words, if you have a symphony, it's about the relationship between the movements. Right. If you have a movement and that it's about the relationship of the parts within that movement. And there's often emotional uh, um, variation between the component parts. Mm -hmm. In most jazz pieces, think about it. There's the head, there's improvisation and the return to the head. And once you've started the particular emotional content or, or, or place of that piece, of that song, of that tune, you're pretty much in it, right? It doesn't change too much. The soloist can argue differently, but the rhythm section is doing what they're doing. Generally so speaking, a, yeah. Generally, generally speak, speaking, I'm, I'm talking yeah. in generalities. Yeah, You're right. Absolutely. You're right. But yeah. but but so that that's another difference it seems to me between the classical realm and the jazz realm. The classical realm, a piece, a movement, can have a journey that is emotionally. I'm just going to say wider generally than the improviser in any particular piece that the improviser is playing. That's another <sighs> difference between the two realms. I, I think we could also discuss some similarities though. Oh yeah. Um, I, I mean, some of the similarities are uh, theme and variations. Mm -hmm. That's, that's one of the common, uh, the common themes or common aspects of what's called European classical and concert music and what some call American classical music, which is, which is jazz. Yeah. Um, there's also the case and the truth that actually improvisation um, earlier in, in the history of European classical and concert music was a, a practice. Um, so it's not common today, but at one time, it is well known that some of the great composers, I mean, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Bach, uh, Bach Mozart. And Beethoven, no question about it. No yeah, question. Yeah, yeah absolutely they, they improvise. Right. 
Right. Absolutely. So maybe right. maybe that's a good a good opportunity to segue into what uh, uh, we had a conversation with Coleman Hughes, who made a distinction between improvisation and classical music and improvisation in jazz. Now, Dan, I know that you, you your view is that improvisation remains central to classical. If I if I understand correctly, your view, music and 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 creation today. Could, so, how do you understand the roles of of improvisation in classical and in jazz? I, I I'd phrase it slightly differently. I'm Milton Babbitt, wonderful composer, very difficult music, but a wonderful composer. He said, "Look, the, the act of composition is improvisation. It just it is. I mean, any composer is writing down." on the fly as you go along. Um, so that's really, now, uh, the, most of our performers do not improvise the way uh, Greg just said, Bach and Beethoven did before. No question about it. That's a, a somewhat of a lost art, I suppose, in, in the classical world and jazz has perhaps taken over that realm in some respects. So I'd say that the forms complement each other in that respect. Um, there aren't many classical performers who are improvisers that I know of. There are a few, there are a few. I keep reading about a few who, who love to do it, but not, not very many. Um, now, there's a reason for that also, and that is that Bach and Beethoven had very clear styles. Their language was very much their own. They knew it. Performers of today are playing you know, music from the Baroque, the classical period, the Romantic period, the 20th mm. century period, where there's a plethora of languages and possibilities. So to actually speak, you know, what, what would be the point of someone improvising in the style of Mozart or Beethoven? It's right. not their language per se. Right. It right. was Mozart's. It was Beethoven's, baby. He spoke the way he wanted it to speak. And there wasn't any question. Um, so it's more problematic and, um, jazz improvisers, we'd have to th think about this, but so what is the language in which a jazz improviser is actually improvising in? What is the language of jazz? I mean, that would be an interesting discussion. You know, oh, what was, uh, look, you know, Witten doesn't like bitches brew because he feels it was a sellout to pop. I don't think, I don't know if Miles saw it that way or not, but his language, the music of Bitches Brew is different from a kind of blue. Yeah, the, <laughs> obviously different than kind of blue. I mean, we're going from, right. from cool all of a sudden, you know, into, yeah, a fusion thing, which was what Larry Coriel did as well. Now, that's another language of combining aspects, or particularly in this case, we'd have to d d define it clearly, the rhythmic aspects of what was pop music into the language of jazz in the way jazz uses its pitch materials. That's, mm -hmm. that's a whole nother, I mean, that's a deeper conversation that I don't think we need to go into here, by the way. Right. Not in terms of, you know, that, that particular piece, but I do want to go into yeah. a question that you asked basically, and I'll put it in my own words, mm. you know, what is the jazz improviser improvising on? Mm -hmm. and through. So but before I answer that question, I do want to say that if you look at a traditional, you talked about a particular song. So if you're talking about a particular song, yes, the general format is theme, statement of theme, mm -hmm. melody, yep. uh, and then an improvisation on, and here's a, in part the answer to the question, you're improvising on the melody on the harmony, the chord changes of the song, exactly. the mood of the song. Now, if the yeah. song has lyrics, the lyrics have particular meaning and you're improvising in nonverbal sense, mm. unless you're scatting mm. uh, verbally, on the mood, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and often the mood leads to a particular way of handling you know, your tonality, a particular way of emphasizing um, how fast you're playing, um, the amount of vibrato, all these different elements go into what you're improvising on. But I did want to say about the jazz set. Now you said that once they play a song, it usually stay in the same, uh, the same mode, you can say, right? Yeah. And that's true, except for songs that consciously have 
you know, different tempos in the same song or has a, a swing rhythm as a part of it and a Latin rhythm as a part of it. And there are songs like that, you know, A right. Night Has a Thousand Eyes, A Night in Tunisia and such. Um, but if you look at an entire set, let's say 50 minutes of music, usually the jazz ensemble is taking the audience on a journey where there will be different moods and different fields mm. and different emotional range. Mm. So one of the things that I, I'm leading up to saying is that I think one of the reasons that Albert Murray would say that jazz is a fine art is because one, there are masters and masterpieces that you can point to in the form and identify why they are masterpieces. That's one aspect. And one aspect that I think is important in jazz too, is that the range and depth of emotional um, fluency, cogency, range is greater than in uh, most of a pop music and certainly folk music. And so though it may be different in terms of the European classical and concert tradition, I think that when you look at jazz overall, there's such a range of styles and feelings that that too fits into the fine art category. If I can just comp very briefly to, to what Greg just said, that as Stanley Crouch wrote, jazz is music for adults. I mean, if, if, if pop and rock is as much more adolescent the emotion in jazz music is not adolescent. This is music for adults. And that speaks to the emotional range. Yeah, absolutely no question about it. No, no, Murray makes that distinction very, very clearly. And I think I even refer that, uh, referred to that in my article. So Murray is, he says, look, folk music is just that. It's music of the folk. It's meant to evoke certain emotions that are pretty clear, that are pretty simple. The music doesn't have much of a profile. It doesn't have much individuality. It does not rise to the status of art. He says- A fine art. A fine he calls art. it folk art. A oh, fine okay. art, right. Okay, you're, you're right. Yeah. He calls folk it folk art. art. Yeah. Okay, right. and he makes a very clear distinction between that and <laughs> the notion of high art and high culture that he finds in very incredibly satisfying in Western civilization generally. And you're absolutely right. He says in jazz should, it fits into, into that category as high art. Now, by the way, the same distinction is made by Gunther Schuller, and I'm sure they must have known each other pretty well. You know, and Gunther is very clear. Gunther talks about classical music, he talks about jazz, and then he doesn't talk about folk art or pop. He calls it commercial music. Commercial, music. <laughs> right. and he says right. he says commercial music is just that. It's written to make money, and it's written for a particular commercial situation, and does not find itself within the category of fine art. I couldn't agree more with him. I couldn't agree. Now he had trouble with some uh, 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 contemporary classical music of his time. Uh, just, so, just so you know, and I'm not going to, uh, he had trouble with Philip Glass and Steve Reich, and you know, we don't need to argue the aesthetic merits or lack thereof in their music. But he said, look, I can't program this because I don't think it fulfills the criteria of, quote, high art music that I would like. Now, most people would think, guess what, Gunther, you were wrong, baby. <laughs> Simple as that. Those guys, they stood up pretty well. Um, but well, but who knows? I mean, all of this stuff is subject to the um the ultimate problem, which is the test of time. You know, you we're all in this right now. We're we're mm -hmm. all right here. We'll find out in a hundred years what actually actually what what finally lasts. I think you're right, Greg. You know, I think, yeah, there are masterpieces in the in the jazz idiom. And those are going to be there. I mean, what I loved about Winton's book, and I'm forgetting the name of it right now, is Winton, at least at the end, says, you know, guys, just, just so we're clear, jazz does not take the place of Beethoven and Stravinsky in the same way that no contemporary artist, Pollock or, Bar uh, or Barnett Newman or whomever, takes the place of Matisse. You know, I mean, these are acknowledged masterworks, and we'll see then what gets added to that. I think Murray's also very clear. He doesn't see the artistic world 
or high culture as being flat, right? Not everything is equal. He That's says, right. hey, there are certain things that, you know, are really good. And there are other things that just aren't. And Ralph Ellison right. makes the same point. I mean, there's right. a reason that his book, um, The Invisible Man, you know, is, is considered a masterpiece and still is 70 right. years later because it's a seminal work that defined Amer Black American culture and Black um, American literature. Well, a Amer uh, human experience through Black American culture, Black American culture's particular idiomatic, particular embodiment of just the human experience. What Ellison, the last lines, who knows? Who knows, right? On but that on the lower frequencies, yes, I speak for I you. Speak for you. Yes. <laughs> so that was a signal <laughs> to the to the universality. Uh, and the connectivity from the particular to the universal that you're alluding to. Exactly. I mean, I didn't, I didn't mean to say that it only is right. considered great within black American culture. I said right. sure. it represents in the same way that I wouldn't say call it sleep by, by Roth, Roth. Uh, is, mm. you know, it, it's a Jewish American book right. that expresses right. something absolutely universal for all of us. Yeah. So pardon me for being slightly pedantic. Just today, when people throw out terms black and white, it's just a confusion between race and culture is so prevalent. Sometimes yeah, we just, you need it. So it's, it's, sometimes we're doing it then, not because we don't think you understand or get it, but we want to make sure that the audience is, is, is clear on you. some of these I distinctions. Hear I hear you. Okay. So, so Ellison, one thing that's really interesting about Ellison, and I want to go back to something that was super interesting, what you said about, Mozart and, and Bach and Beethoven and improvising in your own voice. The necessity of having your own voice to improvise. So a, a point that Ellison made and Thomas Mann, you know, achieving a piece of reality, not experiencing life secondhand and not speaking and articulating your, ex your experience secondhand, but really having your own voice you have achieved a portion of reality. That's the, that's the, the role of the artist. Uh, and that's extremely rare and difficult to achieve. Most of us, simply by the fact of language, are living second, third, fifth, sixth hand with inherited ideas that come down through the language and the atmosphere within which we live. So I wonder when you're describing the original improvisers, and they were improvising, and they were able to improvise. And it's interesting to hear them improvising because they're speaking in their own voice. You know, people today, they, we, we lament the lack of, even in jazz today, you know, we're, we're all very aware of the criticisms that, you know, uh, uh, where's the, where, did jazz really stop? I disagree with this, but did jazz really stop developing after the late 60s? Was Coltrane the end? And there is, a, you know, with all the different schools out there today, are people able to improvise? Are they just playing licks? Have they, you know, they, is anyone speaking in their own voice? This is improvisational right now. Thinking to you, Dan, I'm wondering, is perhaps, you know, why, why don't we find great improvisers today? Is it linked? Because if improvisation is dependent upon having your own voice and your own portion in reality, you have to have as an assumption that there's an objective reality. You have to have an, as an assumption, as a cultural intellectual assumption, that there's this thing called truth. Do you think these things are linked? Yes. If I understand what you've said correctly, and it's, that's, that's, that's a tough, that, that was a tough um, uh, stream of stuff, but uh, very deep that I'd like to be able to go over again. But let me, let me, think, let me think for a minute and then try and tackle it. So... Here, here, let's look at part of the issue. When Mozart and Beethoven wrote, they were writing in a fairly circumscribed world and a circumscribed culture. They didn't really know about gamelan. They didn't know about Indian classical music. Um, they didn't need to feel that to be well-rounded, they needed to know all of that. 
Remember, Mozart and Beethoven didn't go to a conservatory. They didn't go to a college or a university and get a DMA in musical <laughs> composition. You know, they started when they were kids. They played it. This was part and parcel of their milieu and their culture. It was all tremendously unified and um, without questions. There were, there were no questions about their musical culture and their musical language. Think about the situation of a composer today or a jazz improviser today. Arya, you're involved in Sephardic Jewish music. Okay, that means you have to know about Jewish Sephardic music. Right? You, have to, you have to really learn the ins and outs of it. How does somebody learn that and become part of that if it's not their culture? Or, or is that a problem? Are they, is somebody allowed? I mean, this comes to down the question of appropriation. I'm far from an expert, just to be clear. But, yeah. but to, just to speak of a footnote to, yeah. to, dem, to illustrate what you're talking about, the first thing you need to do is you need to spend time going to synagogues in which the Paitan, in which the leader of the prayer is using makamat, is using the Arabic modes, you know, the scales. Yeah, you have to, yeah. that, has to, that has to sink in, seep in, it has to become part of your experience, et cetera. There you go. So it has to seep in. Um, the person who's really interested in Indian music really has to st steep themselves in that music and the culture to really under understand it. Greg, you said something before that was really important that I'm going to come back to just for a minute that just, I have to admit, I, it hadn't occurred to me. And that was, yeah, the jazz improviser, if they're not scatting, let's just use that as a caveat for right now, but the tune has words. That provides another level of association, another level of realization of the melody upon which he or she is improvising. They have to know, they have to be deep into those words then as well. And as an instrumentalist, as a trombonist, I have to admit, I, I wasn't thinking about that. That was, that's something new for me. Oh, that's good. That's great. I mean, one of the things, I mean, Lester Young, Prez, he was known, I mean, you have in the history of jazz, the two primary icons of tenor saxophone playing in early jazz would be Coleman Hawkins, mm -hmm. who was more of a, say, a harmonic. I mean, my, my old friend, my late friend, Michael James, introduced to me by Albert Murray, mm -hmm. who was Duke Ellington's nephew. He would say, Hawk. Coleman Hawkins, never missed a change. He never missed a change. So he played <laughs> according to, he, he played according to the harmonies. And he also went and would say played in a style that was a, a approach that was from the, he also played clarinet early on. Mm -hmm. So that particular style, Lester Young, Prez, he played more melodically, mm -hmm. okay, based on the melody. So it's like two different, ways you have vertical improvisation mm -hmm. and horizontal mm -hmm. improvisation. Mm -hmm. So they're two different approaches. Prez would always say, baby, you got to know the words. You got to mm -hmm. know the words to these songs. And when you listen to Ben Webster, mm -hmm. another great of that era, probably the greatest jazz balladeer on tenor saxophone, mm -hmm. he said, always knew the words. Because when you're playing the melody, you are literally singing through your horn. The words. And so when you're improvising, that is there also. And I do want to say something about melody that points to the spiritual nature of a melody. Quincy Jones, who is someone who traverses the world of pop music, commercial music, mm -hmm. fine art, uh, studied with um, uh, Boulanger, was mm -hmm. it uh, Nadia Boulanger, mm -hmm. um, was deeply enmeshed in the jazz world, played with Lionel Hampton in the orchestra, sitting next to Clifford Brown. One of his books, he says, you know, you can get very technical about music. You know, you could talk about counterpoint and different harmonies and, and, and inversions and this and that, you know, and you could talk about 
uh, and, and analyze music very analytically. But he says, when you're talking about melody, that's from God. You know, there's no, there's no school for that. There's no school for melody, baby. That's, you know, so. And, and let me know. tell you, so, so Gunther Schuller, who was involved obviously in the classical world and in the avant-garde jazz world, as he got older and when he read, st- and when he wrote, st- uh, wrote about his experiences, he said, you know, we made a mistake. We forgot about melody. And by the way, it's not so easy to write a really good melody. It right. just isn't. And what <laughs> you're also saying is, if it ain't got that swing, it don't mean a thing. <laughs> that's right, dude. Okay. And that's that, right. Yeah. yeah. So, and right. that's just that's just the nature of it. So either it works or it doesn't. And I agree with Quincy. And by the way, I just got to let you know. Quincy grew up in Seattle, where I grew up. I went to Garfield <laughs> High School with my brother-in-law, and the Garfield now has one of the great jazz ensembles. Uh, uh, they, they they win the award in New York just about every other year, and Tucson wow. wins wins when they don't. So it's an interesting, interesting place. Yeah, Quincy's great. I grew up listening to his his um, well, they were then LPs, his right. his big band right. stuff. Right, that's right. So let me, if we can just steer back for a moment before we move on to a a concluding question. But so the artist, the improvising artist. Yeah, yeah. um, Okay. In order to make (laughs) great art, is the, is, does the, does the improvising artist, is he, is he or she the, the, the embodiment of the human being who has achieved their own portion of reality, the speaking in their own voice? They are, they are list, they're, they're interpreting in their own terms. They're not receiving anything secondhand. Is that necessary for the production of great art? The answer is yes. And you, you've said it before, Arye, in your book. It's also, and look, some of the great jazz artists, most composers have been religious throughout history. The greatest jazz improvisers, they know too. They're connecting to that great tower, right? And they're getting the message from God. And here it comes. Here it is. And you better be ready and available to receive it. Now, what Winton would say, yeah, and how, how do you have to be ready and available? Your technique has to be impeccable because God does not speak in easy terms. It's not broad, <laughs> gener- it's not broad generalities. At yeah. least that's not how we humans can understand it. And we know we're not going to hit quite perfection That's right. Uh, as composers right. and an improviser, but that's always what we're aiming for. And I'll right. use that other little phrase of, of hearing the still small voice. Mm. Every, every great artist has to find that still small voice in them that, that, that lets you know you're moving in the right direction, that you're going towards the right goal. And yeah, that's really hard to find. You know, for con- for conductors, I mean, just it doesn't happen until you're in your sixties. You know, mm. there's some. I mean, Dudamel's great was great at thirty, but Dudamel's going to be really good when he's sixty. You know, and my guess is most of the great improvisers, well, they didn't live all that long. Look, and this is not a generality. Mozart writes some great stuff when he was sixteen, but he started when he was three. Right. You know, so okay, right. he already had more than a decade and a half under his belt. So you you got to have some experience. You have to have some life experience, and you have to be able to put all that out into the world to say, "Look, here's what I think. I'm cutting out all the crap. No more. No more. I'm not. I'm not trying to impress anybody. Here it is." And the best improvisers are doing the same thing, right? They're not trying to impress. They're trying to to go down deep and say, Mm. here's what I think. Here's what I hear. Here's what I feel. Here's what I feel. I want you to feel and hear what I what I think because it's real. And are you maybe you maybe you use that word? I mean, it's it's real. This is this is the real sense of what reality is. This is, I mean, there's real is in the word reality. It's Mm -hmm. it's it's the essence, it's it's the truth, it's the. I'm, again, 
uh, yeah, there's, there's a certain loss of words when you come to describe this, because as you just said, Greg, that's why art is so important. The feeling contains Emmett. It contains the truth. Mm. It contains that deepest stuff that makes our lives most worth living after you peel away all of the nonsense that surrounds us. And speaking of the West, I mean, if you, you're talking about, you know, the fundamental archetypal qualities and virtues, the good, the true, and the beautiful. Yeah. So it has all of those dimensions. I do want to say something. Uh, just one or two quick things before we go to that last question, uh, are you? Um, one that in a s slight defense of pop music, so much of it is commercialized, but many pop musicians in various genres, uh, when they are in the creative mode, they're not necessarily thinking about, okay, um, let me see what can make the most money. I had a hit over here. Now let me, they're, they're, a lot of times their producers are thinking like that. The record companies are thinking like that, but I do want to defend um, the creative process and artistry in general, because they too tap into that. I also want to say that there are certain examples of pop music and artists who transcend uh, either, you know, a folk level or a particular genre, conventional genre identification and go to pop that is fine art. Uh, I'll give it just one or two examples. Uh, every time I hear Whitney Houston's uh, version of the Star Spangled Banner at the Super Bowl, I think in 1991, it gives me chills. That's fine art. I can defend that as fine art. Uh, Donny Hathaway, for all we know, that ballad, that's fine art. So there, there are examples, and we can explain what so by which we mean it's a masterpiece. It will stand the test of time. So there are examples there because there are certain people who, who will be listening to this and say, oh, those elitists, they don't think they, they just poo poo pop music. Well, <laughs> okay. I just want to give a couple of examples. And I also want to say that another tie between jazz and classical music, particularly on the jazz side, is that so many jazz artists study what we call classical music. Uh, as a part of the training. See, when we talk about developing your own style, your own voice, there's a process through which people go through. And you can sum it up in the apprentice method. You know, you start off as an apprentice, you become a journeyman, then a master craftsman. By the time you're a master craftsman, you have to find and develop your own voice. But that takes time. Who are you? You start by studying you know, the past masters and past masterpieces as you work on your own sound, on your instrument or your particular style as a composer. And you go through a developmental process and then you come into your own to tap into that reality that Arya is talking about. But as far as jazz artists, I mean, Art Tatum, it's obvious that Art Tatum studied the classical repertoire. Obviously, <laughs> um, he, Ahmad he, Jamal, you know, uh, Keith Jarrett, Herbie Hancock, you know, Winton, of course, Hubert Law. So I think I can make a case he's the greatest flautist in the world. I mean, and so on. There, there are other uh, modern jazz quartet. You know, there's a classical jazz quartet with Ron Carter on bass, um, uh, Louis uh, Nash on drums, Stefan Harris on vibes. And, um, oh, what's his name? Ke Kenny? Uh, Kenny Barron. Yes, Kenny <laughs> Barron on piano. Great. So, you know, so there's other interplays that we alluded to in the beginning. I want to get a little more specific about some of the tie-ins between uh, jazz and classical that way, too. Fair enough. Dan, before we, before we proceed to our last question, do you want to respond to anything there? By the way, this is an argument that Greg and I have. Uh, he has a more generous interpretation of pop music. I love some pop music. It, yeah. you know, it's, I think it has more to do with my childhood and what moves me particularly. I don't know if I'm ready to, to categorize it as fine art, but this is an argument that we're going to continue with moving forward. Do you have any response to, to Greg? Uh, yeah. So it's, it's, 
I still think open to debate. We'll have to see how it works. I agree with Arye. I think most popular music is just that. It's popular at a particular time because it serves a particular population at a particular time in their lives. I, I love some of the tunes of the Beatles, right? I think they're great tunes. Will they make it? Is there something there that people are going to want to study and look at in a hundred years? I don't know. As for the creative process, I agree with you, Greg. A good buddy of mine, Jan Swafford, who has written wonderful music and great biographies of Ives and Brahms and Beethoven and the last one, Mozart, he said, when I, when I saw some of this new footage that came out with the Beatles, um, putting some of their tunes together in the Abbey Road studio, I said, that's the best example of how the creative process works that I've ever seen. Here are these guys sitting around and somebody's, somebody plays something, the other, other one takes off on it. Now, this is a group process. Uh, that's admittedly, that's, we can talk about that as, a, as an issue, but... Um, Okay, and then they do it and somebody adds something else and somebody says, no, that's not quite right. What if we try this? And then says, no, nah, that's not quite right. And then Paul comes in with something and boom, the, it just locks in, baby. You know, and there it is. Well, yeah, that's how the creative process works on the individual basis too. Um, will some of these pop materials end up being, you know, maybe we're going to say, Damn, you know, Sgt. Peppers is as good a song cycle as Winterreise of Schubert. Maybe in 200 years, they're going to say, it is. That's just, that's just a fact. You know, there's not a weak link. There's not a bad song in that, on that disc. Now, is it, does it have the emotional richness? You know, Schubert actually used real poetry by real poets who he acknowledges great poets. I'm not sure the lyrics I want to hold your hand are going to hold up on the long term. <laughs> but the thing is, okay, but what about the American songbook? The oh, American gonna, songbook, Gershwin, Cole Porter. I mean, there I are some you. great I lyricists I and their poets. I, okay. I know they are. I know they are. And some of those songs I think are really good. And a lot of them, I just... I think they're symptomatic of a particular time in American music. And I have to admit, I don't find them, quote, great, unquote. But I, I'm going to agree with you guys that this is a debate that should be ongoing. Right. Okay. And, the, and that we should keep talking about it because it's not settled. And by the way, even if we were to settle it in 50 years, there are going to be a couple of other guys who are going to come and say, I don't care what Arya and Greg said. They were wrong. Let me explain why right. this isn't, isn't deep stuff. Okay. Right, so, right. And lastly, when we look at oeuvres, when we look at bodies of work, Duke Ellington's body of work. I hear you. Delon Delonious Monk's body of work and compositions. I mean, these are great composers in and through the jazz idiom. So, I mean, that's just, yeah. Agreed. Agreed. The, the stuff I took to college, there were a few LPs I took and it was Thelonious Monk. I mean, that guy had a really interesting mind. He might have been oh, yeah. nuts, but he had a really interesting nutso mind that came up with stuff that was just incredibly cool. Let's follow that for a couple of minutes. Please tell us about what you find so fascinating about Thelonious Monk's mind. Oh, because Monk was out there. He was, you, you've ju we've just said, to be a real composer, you have to follow your own road. You have to follow your own journey. I don't think he had an easy time of it. Come on. I mean, it took a while for him to be recognized. And, and even when he was, it was so far out, right? Um, I mean, Cecil Taylor. I, there was a time in the 60s when, when jazz improvisers and classical music really came together. And that's an example of 
a, a fringe realm of, of, of Cecil stuff and what people were doing in, in the classical world, trying to, to uh, um, produce improvisation, to make sketches of ideas that people could follow, to make uh, rather than completely realized scores. So there was this intersection, Schuler called it third, third stream. It didn't quite work as, as everybody hoped, it, it, it seems to me. Um, you know, the jazz guys thought the classical guys liked it and the classical guys thought the jazz guys liked it and nobody was really happy. So finally, they looked at each and said, oh, OK, maybe it's not quite what we had hoped for. But I'm sorry, back to Thelonious Monk. Come, come on, just just the way he heard sonorities. Mm. You know, he was already hearing dissonance, as Schoenberg had said in some respect, it's not dissonance. It's another way of hearing a consonance if you repeat it enough. So mm. his 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 language was so idiosyncratic. It was so that's, personal. That's, but, that, yeah. but see, the thing is, that's so true, because I've actually... I've done some pre-concert lectures at Jazz at Lincoln Center on Thelonious Monk, so I really yeah. did, did a deep dive into Monk. But another thing is his particular way of approaching jazz fundamentals, his way of dealing with syncopation, his way of dealing with what in bebop they call the quote-unquote flatted fifth, right. um, his way of sometimes you take a, a song like... Um, Sweet Georgia Brown. Uh -huh. And he he slowed it down. So instead of, let me see, bum, 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 he would highlight, it would be minimalist. He has a song, Bright Mississippi. Boop, 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 boop. This, the little shards of that melody line, you yeah. know? Uh, and, and so, and so there's just, what a study uh, Monk is, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, and what you're talking about is another, at least a some, somewhat, at least to state it, there's a difference, uh, different idea of time in jazz yes. and in classical. Yes, music. yes. Just a different sense of time. Right. and And Monk really highlights that in, in his stuff a lot. Now, right. in American classical contemporary music of the last hundred years. Again, we're going to bring this back to Arye's last question by at least coming back to the very opening of what we started about. The Omni-American. You can't talk about Aaron Copeland, the father of American classical contemporary music, and not talk about jazz and not talk about everybody hearing jazz and our understanding of therefore rhythm. Almost all American composers almost, you can't get away from the fact that we all grow up hearing popular music and jazz. It's just part of who we are. That's why right, we're right. omni-Americans. There's not much, there's not a huge difference in, in the terrain between jazz and contemporary classical. But let me just rephrase that. There are many similarities. There are many okay. differences as well, but there are lots of similarities. And the American classical composer can't get away from the fact that that's part of who he or she is. So let's bring things home. I don't know if this is going to be a satisfying resolution. It might be open-ended, but Dan, would it be fair to classify you as a thinker that you, that you, you belong more firmly in the conservative camp in the United States? That is true. Would you? Okay. Well, now we've had this conversation uh, about art and music, and the you know we've touched a little bit on the the human depths that heart that that art reflects and the heights to what we aspire and and, and various aspects of of the artistic experience, what music uh, the function that it plays, et cetera, et cetera. It seems that quite often for modern conservatives, art in general. But tell me, you know, tell me if you agree with the statement, and if so, I'd love to hear your thoughts. There are, of course, exceptions to the rule. And I know that you're a, a, a deep reader of Roger Scruton and et cetera, et cetera. But it seems that by and large, or would you agree that by and large, modern conservatives delegate to the arts an ornamental role and that the arts are not taken seriously quite often 
in the conservative community? I would agree uh, completely with that. And there's a very simple reason why I think that is the case. Uh, most conservatives have studied philosophy. They've studied literature, maybe, maybe. They've definitely studied economics. They've definitely studied what they think of as history, which is the defining events of history. And they love ideas. They love ideas. Some of them have even studied religion, should have included that as well. But they have rarely found the time or were encouraged to study the arts and to mm. understand that the arts fundamentally are about aesthetic ideas. There's mm. a reason that for the ancients, music was a pro the primary art form and was as important as rhetoric and uh, mathematics. It's because music was the essence of the celestial sounds. It was the essence of human beings meeting the world That's and the universe. That's where it happened. Going back to Pythagoras. You bet, baby. I mean, it was the most important. It was part of the quadrivium and the trivium. It was what you learned to be a human being. Right. And yes, in the conservative world, being a real human being has not included the music, much to its detriment. Uh, the conservative world has ceded most of culture, certainly popular culture, and most of high culture now to, to uh, the, uh, uh, the liberal and progressives. To their misfortune, it seems to me. Bloom said it most beautifully in his book, The Closing of the American Mind. He said, if we don't teach our students, something about their emotional landscape, the ideas that we present will not find any place to lodge in their beings. Mm -hmm. In other words, if they're listening only to heavy metal, and then you want to come and talk about Nietzsche and uh, Plato <laughs> and Aristotle and Maimonides, it's hard for those ideas to find a place to root. And that's where I think we are now in our culture. That's why I think we're in such a dangerous place. If I'm hearing you correctly, just you said a new idea, which is that uh, uh, that you think that the the cultural world is this the emotional world is impoverished. I think so. I think generally that's true. It's a problem in our culture generally, and it's in part due to the fact of not understanding and not taking a serious look at. As at your word, are a reality of who we are as human beings, of taking it seriously. Greg, what you said, truth, beauty, and goodness, that's almost absent from university life. I make a joke now with, with, with students when they come in or about the state of the university. So some young student comes up to me and says, Professor Asia, I hear you teach this course on human achievement and innovation in the arts. And you talk about Beethoven and Picasso and Rembrandt and uh, Mozart and, and the Stravinsky. And, and, and the person says, well, you know, I really like Lady Gaga and Madonna. You know, what's the problem? You know, why can't I just listen to those? Because I don't understand we should be learning about this other stuff. And by the way, that's, that's being generous. Most students, most of our, 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 our populace under 30 have never heard a piece of Mozart, never heard a piece of Beethoven, never heard of Stravinsky. Greg, okay. you said, hey, the, the, the jazz guys that you mentioned, all of the greats, they know the rite of spring. That was seminal for them. Matter of fact, Charlie Parker and solos would quote from it. There you go. And they know <laughs> Slolinsky. They want to know all about the modes that he came up with that we know or that we didn't know. That's right. Coltrane studied that deeply. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah. this, is, this is not something that's different in the field of classical or jazz. This is where we all come together and the serious jazz improvisers know that what he's doing in his life 
has a seriousness to it that he better attend to, as should the classical composer. Well, Murray says in the Album of the Americas, if you recall, that the artist takes his or her vocation as seriously as, you know, a, a, a priest would in a religion, um, as, uh, as, as, a, as a doctor, you know, would in there, because they are, but that's, this is my word, this is soul work. This is, this is the exemplification of the soul coming through and coming out in one's identity, which connects us to other souls. So this is very deep, deep, uh, stuff when we when we start talking about art and aesthetics, but I have to say that if the conservatives and you're really talking about conservative, really intellectuals, you're not talking about per right. se the Republican Party. Right. I don't want to say that you're talking right. about conservatives, real in terms of principles. Yeah. If they have ceded the arts and aesthetics to the liberals and progressives, uh, then. Um, we're in trouble, not because they're liberal or progressives, but because of the gargantuan takeover of all arts by commercial art, by popular culture. OK, um, <laughs> to, one, one of the critiques of uh, uh, one of the words of, for pop culture, um, a friend of mine, Kenny Washington, who was my first great jazz teacher, great jazz drummer great jazz historian. He teaches at Juilliard jazz and such. He calls it popcorn music. You eat it. It just, you know, it disappears here today, gone tomorrow. But we emphasize fine art, not because, we, just because we believe in a, an elite art form, because of the depth of it, the emotional and spiritual and aesthetic depth, which ties into our depth as human beings. So we, we are, we're on a mission here on this podcast and in the Our American Future Project to bring these ideas. And I'll just end my little peroration with this. Uh, one, this of the things, great. One, one of the things that Albert Murray says is that Americans, we are the heir to all of the great culture and civilization of the past. It's all our inheritance, not to appropriate it, but it's a foundation upon which we can build our lives as individuals, our cultures, our civilizations for the future. There's been great achievements. There's been a lot of degradation also. There's been light and shadow. Let's look at the light and tap into the light so that we can create, you know, some light, better light for the future. It's hard for me to add to that other than mm -hmm. to say, amen. 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 I mean, I mean, as an addendum, what does is, what is Murray also say in Omni American and Stomping the Blues? And that is, it's going from the dance and concert hall on Saturday night into the church on Sunday morning. Right and Saturday for the night Jews, function for, for the to Jews, the Sunday morning church. Yeah, service. and for I, I, you know, I'm this. This might be a bit. I mean, it seems like we got to a peak, and this is a great coda. I actually have a question. Do, <laughs> Dan, do you have five more minutes? Uh, that's the max. Do you think? Okay, so if if the arts are now are uh, uh, the left, the political left, mm -hmm. the liberal and progressive left really has uh, dominates when it comes to the arts. For, for, a conservative response would seem part of the problem that we're locked into. It seems that in, in responding to that, oftentimes the art comes off as didactic, which is not good art. But then the question becomes, is there any way to reinstate the wholeness? Is there any way to plug back into that power station of the soul that Greg is referring to? Is there any way to do that if art, if art is not reintegrated into a greater whole, into a greater story that we tell ourselves that's connected to religion, that's connected to philosophy? Can you have a, 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 a vital response without, with, without stepping outside of the secular matrix? I think the history of art... That's an easy question there, though. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> uh, the history of art is of the 20th century uh, it seems to me is is doing just that. It's trying to show that the materials of art themselves 
have the possibility of deepening the soul, even if we have untethered it from religion. That's what the modernists, I think, were, were doing in their, in their artwork, is saying the materials themselves, that's the nature of abstraction. God created the world, but we can now also just create another world out of the materials of the art form itself. Mm. Now, whether that was hubris or not, I don't know. Again, we'll find out another 50 years or 100 years. But I think that we can make the case that the arts, the high arts as we know them, are vital for the continuance of humankind that has a soul. And as we confront the machine age and the David, a, and AI and AI, I mean, David Galanter has been right on this. Uh, an, an AI computer guy, Yale, says, I'm sorry, but all of this talk about I, AI replacing computers is absolutely nonsense. Mean humans. Yeah, because you can't. Mm-hmm. Humans have a soul. Machines don't have souls. They will never have souls, no matter how human we try and make them. Our job now is to make sure that humans don't become machine-like, but rather that they retain their souls. Now, that's a great way and place to conclude. Wouldn't you agree, Arye? I agree 100%. Maestro Dan Asia, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to the classroom, uh, listening to you. Great pleasure. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, And, um, you know, keep on keeping on. Let's let's do that. And remember, maybe this is just the start of a great conversation because this was great, great fun. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Take care, gents. Thank you for watching us on Straight Ahead, the Omni American podcast. Subscribe today and fight for a future in which the many join as one against bigotry.